thank you very much everyone for attending this session on the foundations of probability with R. My name is Elijah Pia from Ghana, West Africa. I am an economist by profession and I love everything about R. It makes it very easy to work with data of all sorts. And that is why I am always smiling. And that is because I really uh, know R. And if anybody out there should ask, why do you always smile? That is really what I tell them. At least I have been able to uh, create for myself some kind of expertise in one of the uh, most difficult statistical programming languages in the world. So this is still on our lecture series. And today we are going to focus on the foundations of probability with R. And so the goals for this lesson is to introduce the basics of probability, probability calculations for random events and probability distributions in R. And also we would like to expose ourselves to the fundamentals of probability that are relevant for providing a conceptual framework for statistical inference. In every random process, we know the outcomes that could happen, but not the particular outcome that will happen. So for instance, whenever you toss a coin, you know the outcomes would, could be heads or tails. But just that after tossing the coin, you would not know which particular outcome that will happen. And so examples of random processes uh, involves coin toss, rolling a die, or you can even look at the stock market, which makes it very difficult to predict uh, the, the, the stocks okay, in the market. So for this class, we are going to adopt this notation of P into parenthesis A as the probability of any event A. And so at a point in time, if you see the probability and in parenthesis heads, then we are looking at the probability of heads occurring after tossing a coin. And we all seem to agree on this fundamental rule of probability that probability of any given event must lie between zero and one with these values inclusive. And so for instance, if you want to actually assign some belief based on whether rain would fall or not, then as far as you can go is your certainty, which is 100%. And 100% means 100 divided by 100, and that is just one. And if it happens that it would not rain at all, then your probability must be zero, zero percent. And so we agree on this rule that probability must lie between zero and one. Now, there are two schools of thought when it comes to probability that we need to consider right here. We have the frequentist interpretation and they view probability in terms of the proportion of times an outcome occurs. Like for instance, whenever you toss a coin, we know that there are two possible outcomes, heads and tails. So if it happens that you toss the coin and it appears as heads, then the frequentist interpretation would be that the outcome, the particular outcome is one and the possible outcome is two. So it is one out of two for every random process by tossing that coin. So that is the frequentist interpretation of probability. Now, when it comes to the Bayesian interpretation, it is based on subjective degree of belief. Like for instance, if there is the belief that it's going to rain, two or more people may assign their own probabilities in terms of whether or not it is going to rain. So we build on these prior probabilities given by these persons, and we base on that to make a decision as to the particular outcome uh, in the future, which is called a posterior belief. Bayesian interpretation is more or less like a whole course on its own. Uh, so we really want to know um, these two schools of thought when it comes to probability. There are a number of distributions that we are going to look at R, which includes the binomial distribution and the normal distribution, the Poisson distribution, and that of the uh, geometric distribution. And so in terms of binomial distribution, the bi means two. So we use the tossing of a coin for our simulation right here. So whenever we toss a coin, the probability that the heads will appear is one out of the two possible outcomes. And so with these two possible outcomes, heads and tails, the probability that the heads will occur is just one out of two, which is 0 0.5. So it can, also, it can also be said that there is a 50% probability that heads will happen after a coin toss. Now, there is this question that we need to take into consideration. Assuming you toss a coin 10 times, 
and head appears each time. What do you think is going to be the chance that another head will come up on the next toss? Will it still be 0 0.5? Will it be less than 0 0.5 or more than 0 0.5? Now, this is very tricky because we are dealing with a random event, the tossing of a coin. And whenever you toss that coin, it is either heads or tails that will happen. Although you have tossed the coin 10 times, each time the probability that it will come up heads is still 0 0.5. And so once we are considering this random event, it means that the probability that the 11th coin toss will lead to a head will still be 0 0.5, just as it was 0 0.5 for all the previous 10 toss of coins. If you toss the coin like a thousand times and each time or most of the times it is appearing as head, then you might have to check the coin. Probably it may be a bias coin, right? But we must understand the fact that whenever there is a random event, the probability of you tossing the coin is not dependent on the previous outcome. And so the idea that in a random event, uh, you've tossed the coin 10 times and it has appeared as head each time, does not mean that the 11th time is still going to be head. Or the coin is memoryless. It does not remember the previous outcomes. And so it does not say to itself that because I have occurred 10 times as head, why don't I occur as tails the 11th time? So this random event is truly random and it's memoryless. And so the idea that in this random event, uh, the fact that there is some kind of repetitive outcomes, and so the, you would base on that to predict that the likely outcome is going to be head, sometimes in statistics, is known as the gambler's fallacy. So when it, when it comes to gambling, it is a random event and anything can just happen. So the fact that some numbers are playing quite frequently does not mean that the next number is going to be that which appears frequently. So we can simulate a coin toss in R by using the R by norm function. And it takes in three sets of arguments or parameters, the N, size, and prop, where the N means the number of observations or draws. Now the size would represent the coin outcomes. Now, if the size is zero, then it means that there is only one possible outcome, the zero. But if we set the size equal to one, it means that there are two outcomes, zero and one. If you set the size to two or more, then it's just going to mean the number of heads that will appear after the coin is tossed several times. So the size parameter will be likened to the coin outcomes where zero is interpreted as tails and one is interpreted as heads. The prop is simply the probability of occurrence. So if the probability is 0 0.5, then that simulates a fair coin toss. But if the probability is not 0 0.5, then we likely have a bias coin. So when it comes to simulation, we can simulate a fair coin or we can simulate a bias coin. So just as I explained, the size equals zero means that we have only one outcome, zero if interpreted as tails, so zero for tails. If you set the size equal to one, it means we have two outcomes, zero and one. So we interpret the zero as tails, one for heads. If you set your size to be equal to two or more, it means we are considering the number of ones that occur, or let's say the number of heads that occur each time during the simulation. And so let us go into R and practice how to simulate using the R by norm function. So the R by norm function takes in the three arguments, N, the size, and then the prop, which represents the probability. And so if we set N equals one, it means that we are just drawing one observation or draw from the coin toss. Now, if we set the size, equal to zero, and we can also set the probability of say 0 0.5. Now, once the size is set to zero, it means that we have only one outcome, which is tail all the time. So if I highlight this code and run it several times, you will notice that it will always appear as zero, no matter how many times you run the simulation, right? But if we go ahead and set the size equal to one, then we have two possible outcomes, zero, and that of the one itself, where zero means tails and one means head. So by highlighting this line of code, 
and clicking on the run several times, you will notice that it keeps on appearing as zero, but eventually one will also appear because we do have um, zero and one for binary outcomes. And that is the reason behind the term binomial distribution. So the setting n equals one means we are drawing only one outcome each time we run that simulation. But what if we change the n to 10? So let us write the R binom, n equals 10, the size equals one to simulate zeros and ones, and then the probability is 0 0.5 for a fair coin toss, because each time the probability of heads or probability of tail will appear is just 0 0.5. So we are simulating a fair coin toss. And so let's do that for 10 draws of a coin flip. 10 times, and let's see what is going to happen. So if you highlight this line of code and I click on run, you'll notice that with a 50% probability of coming up heads, that is by specifying the prob equals 0 0.5, we notice that the heads interpreted as one appeared four times and tails appeared six times when we made 10 draws from the coin flip. If I run it again, you'll notice that the heads appear five times and the tails also appear five times. If I run it again, we have the heads are six times and then the tails as four times. So once you keep on doing this simulation, it will give you a different set of results. However, they must be very close to the probability that the heads will appear because in, in 10 draws with a fair coin, then chances are that there are going to be five heads and there are going to be five tails. So even if you get six heads, at least it's as close as getting five heads in uh, the 10 draws that we are making from this simulation. So it is not just a fair coin that we can simulate. We can also simulate a bias coin. And so we can also draw, for instance, 10 draws with two possible outcomes. So size equals one and the probability of 0 0.5 coming up as heads, that is going to be the fair coin. But if I make it 0 0.2, then you would notice that this kind of simulation goes in favor of tails all the time. And so by simulating 10 draws from this coin flip, you notice that we have the heads appearing as five times and the tails five times, but let's keep on doing the simulation. And you notice that at this time for the 10 draws, it appeared as tails for all the 10 draws that we made. If I run it again, we'd only have two heads and then we have eight tails. So if you keep on simulating, you will notice that the number of tails always keep on appearing um, more than the number of heads because that is a bias coin in favor of tails because the probability is 0 0.2 approaching zero. If we also simulate the number of draws as 10 and then with a size equals one for two outcomes zero and one and the probability of 0 0.8, that also being a bias coin in favor of heads. Then if I highlight this line of code and then let me clear the console and click on run, then we notice that the number of heads that appear, the number of ones heads are more than the number of tails. There's only one tail and there are nine heads. If I run it again, now there are eight heads and two tails. If I run it again, we have seven heads and three tails. So if you keep on doing that, you see that the number of heads would be much more than the number of tails. And this is a simulation of a bias coin toss. Now, you can also set the size parameter to two or more. Now, when that happens, we are only counting this as the number of heads that will appear whenever we flip the coin two times, three times, or the number of times that we give it. So for instance, let's say that we are drawing one draw with a size of 10, and then a probability of 0 0.5 simulating a fair coin. Then this means that if I should highlight this line of code, if I should highlight this line of code and run, you will notice that six appears. It means that we have zero up to 10. And so when the size is two or more, then we are looking at the number of heads that will appear after we flip the coin 10 times. So by setting the size equals two or more, if the size is two, we are flipping two coins at a time. If the size is three, we have three coins at a time. 
If the size is 10 in this case that we've given it, then we are throwing or tossing 10 coins at a time. So out of that 10 coins, the number of heads that appeared for the first simulation that we ran is six. If I click on it again, the number of heads is four, the number of heads four, the number of heads four, as you keep on running this simulation over and over again. So the size parameter determines the number of coins you are tossing. And the n equals one represents the number of draws that you are making from each time you are doing the simulation. So if I should copy this line of code and then change the number, the parameter n to 10, then we are making 10 draws for each time we are flipping 10 coins. And so by running that line of code, we notice that when we throw or toss the first 10 coins, the number of heads that appeared was four. And then the second time we threw the 10 or we tossed the 10 coins, we also had the number of heads appearing as four times out of the 10. And then for the third time, we also toss our 10 coins, the number of heads is seven. So when you keep on doing this simulation for the number of draws, you would know the number of heads that always occur. So just like I said before, when you set your size equals one, we only have two outcomes, zero and one, where zero is interpreted for tails and one is interpreted for heads. But if it is two or more, then we are describing the number of ones, in which case the number of heads that appear each time we run the simulation. So let's go back to the slide and then box on. So coin flips will yield outcome that follow a binomial distribution. And so the general notation for a binomial distribution is um, the X with a subscript of one up to N means the number of draws that we are making each time we are dealing with a binomial distribution. And the binomial distribution is described by two parameters, the size and that of the P. And so the size represents the number of coins that you flip and the P represent the probability that it will come up heads. So it takes in two parameters, size and P. So when you flip a fair coin 10 times, then it means that the binomial distribution can be represented as binomial, then into parentheses, the size is 10 and the probability is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 means we are simulating a fair coin. So when you flip a fair coin 10 times, then what is the most likely number of heads? Now, the likelihood of outcome would be five heads and five tails because we have a fair coin, 0.5 probability of each occurring as head. So if we should simulate 100,000 draws from a binomial distribution with 10 coin flips and a probability 0.5 coming up heads, then we can ask the question, what is the probability of getting exactly five heads? So you notice in the notation that we have probability that X equals five. So the question is, why do we have to simulate 100,000 draws? Um, we are just going to demonstrate this very soon. But then in a question form, it may appear as if you flip 10 coins, each with a 50% chance of getting heads, then what is the probability of the probability that exactly five of them are heads. So we are going to simulate this 100,000 draws with 10 coin flips and a probability of 0 0.5. So just like we asked, why 100,000 draws? We are going to find out very soon. And so let's go into R and simulate this distribution. So we are going to simulate 100,000 draws with with 10 coin flips and 0 0.5 probability it will come up heads. And so that means we are running a simulation of a binomial distribution with size 10 and a probability of 0 0.5. So we use the R by norm function and then we set the end parameter to 100,000. 
and then the size to 10 coin flips and the probability to 0 0.5. This would result in a very large number of observations. So if I should run this, you see how it, 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 the values are just so huge to an extent that it even gives you up to um, 900 and about 990 uh, number of observations and omits more than 99,000 of them. And so um, let us store this in, in an object. So let's call it an event A. So it is a binomial distribution with 100,000 draws observations with 10 coin flips and a probability of 0 0.5. We are going to calculate the probability that we get exactly five heads. So you can see through, uh, you can see the outcomes right here that for the second time we flipped the 10 coins, we had five heads. So we are going to simulate and find out how many heads, or uh, uh, how, how many of the five heads are we getting from this uh, simulation. And so first of all, we can use a histogram to visualize the number of possible outcomes. So let's have a hist function, and then we pass in the A. Let's see if I run that code, storing it into A, and then if I create a histogram of the A, then you would notice that the, the possible number of heads that took on the majority of outcomes is simply five, which is right here in the, in the, in the middle, okay? represented by the highest bar that we have here. I would like to use the ggplot2. And so let me just go ahead and load the tidyverse package. Let me come up here, the library of tidyverse. And then after it finishes loading up, I will just go ahead and use the A. And then I will chain the ask.data.frame to make it a data frame. If I should run this, and let me only view the first six observations. So like head, and I run this line of code, you will notice that we only end up creating a data frame of the outcomes for the simulation that we've run. So I'm just going to go ahead and also chain. So let me break this one to the next line. And after the data frame, I am going to, initiate the GG plots, and then setting the aesthetic where it is equal to the A, because that is how we labeled it. And then we end up plotting a histogram of that. So you can see that we have five heads having the most frequent observation. Now, the whole reason is that we chose a probability of 50%, it will come up heads. And then we set the number of coin flips to 10 coin flips. And so with each time we toss the 10 coins with a probability of 0 0.5, we have a fair chance that we are going to get five heads and five tails. And so you see the five heads having the majority of the outcomes in the 100,000 draws that we made from the simulation. Now, in order to make it this very clear, you can see it uses a continuous scaling on my x-axis. That is beyond um, this lesson, but then I will just go ahead and um, add a scale. So a scale x continuous, and I'm going to set the bricks argument to one, two, 10, like that. And then let me choose the theme minimal. So I'm just adding some touches to our plot to make it very um, nice. Okay. Non numeric argument to a binary operator. Hmm, what happened? Oh, sorry. I'm choosing a theme, so it should be plus the theme. Thank you. All right. Great. So now it is very visible that we have the number of heads as five having the most frequent occurrence in that 100,000 draws and there are about 25,000 of them, right? So <clears throat> the probability of getting exactly five heads 
This is how we are going to do it. Now we have stored the 100,000 observations into A. And so we are going to grab the A and then set it equal to five. And we use the double equal sign for equality, all right? So when you set it A equals five and run that result, each time we had five heads appearing in the 10 coin flips for that 100,000 uh, draws, it is going to report that as true. And any other number of heads apart from five is going to report that as false. Now, it is known in R that the true holds the value of one and false holds the value of zero. So it is more or less like a scaling to the binomial representation of zeros and ones, right? And so if I go ahead and check the mean where A equals five, then we are getting approximately 25% probability that we'll get exactly five heads whenever we toss 10 coins. This is going to be referred to as the density of the binomial distribution at exactly five heads. So the major description could be, let's go back to the slides and perhaps we have much more explanation to give to that. So we ended up noticing from R that the probability of getting exactly five heads whenever we toss 10 coins for that 100,000 draws, uh, the most frequent occurrence was five heads. And so the probability of getting exactly five heads was 0 0.247, which approximates to 0 0.25, which is 25% uh, probability when we use the mean of that. And so by going into the slides, we notice that the mean of the binomial distribution with 10 coin flips and a 50% probability of coming up heads, it was approximately 25%. So there is a graph on the right-hand side to show that illustration. So we do have the number of heads appearing as five for all the simulation most of the times because we are simulating a fair coin toss with 50% probability of getting heads, right? So when we calculated the mean of the binomial distribution of getting exactly five heads with 10 coin flips and the probability 50% coming up heads, and we had 0 0.25, that is known as the density of the binomial distribution at that particular point. R also provides a function for calculating the probability of uh, getting exactly some number of heads that you give it in a binomial distribution. And that function is known as the D binom, which also takes in three sets of arguments, where N will represent the number of heads that you give it, the size will represent the number of coin flips. So if you are tossing 10 coins, then size equals 10. And then the probe is simply the probability of getting heads. And so um, the probability of getting exactly five heads, we pass that into the D binom for the N parameter. So if you want to run that code in R, then D binom, the first argument, N must be equal to five, and that is going to calculate the probability of getting exactly five heads. The size equals 10, which represents the number of coin flips, and the prop is the probability 50% that it will come up heads. And that is by simulating a fair coin toss. So let us go into R and calculate the probability of getting exactly five heads. So we use the D by norm. So probability of getting exactly five heads, we use the D by norm function. And then we set the N argument to five heads, then the size to 10 coin flips, and the probability is 0 0.5 for a fair coin. And so if we run that, you notice N equals five on use argument error in D by norm, size equals 10 probability of 0 0.5. All right, so let us look at the argument clearly to see whether we had it right. So I am seeking help from R concerning the D by norm function. So the D by norm, okay, takes in X as the argument. So I think I kind of misplaced it right there. So it's supposed to be X and not N. So let's correct that as well. So it means that the first argument rather is X. And if you look at the explanation, it is called the vector of quantiles. Hmm. If it makes sense, fine. But if it doesn't, just take X argument as the 
probability of getting the exact number of hairs that you're going to give it. So in this case, we are just saying, what is the probability of getting exactly five hairs? The size is the number of trials, zero or more. So we call that the number of coin flips. So in this case, we set it equal to 10, so 10 coin flips. And the prop is the probability of success on each trial. And so we are looking at the probability of getting heads, right? So by running this now, mind you that when we calculated the mean where the simulation of 100,000 draws was equal to five heads, we had a mean of 0.25, that is 25%. That is the probability we are talking about here. But by using the D by norm, let's run this one and see whether we are going to get anything close. So you can see that when using the D by norm, it means that the probability of getting exactly five heads is also 25% when approximated to two decimal uh, places. So you can calculate the mean of an exact number of heads using the simulation. You simulate 100,000 draws, and then you set it to an object called A, and then you set A equal to five to mean cases where the number of heads were five, and just simply find the mean, and that gives the probability of getting that uh, exact number of heads. Or you can use the D by norm function and set the first argument to the number of heads that you are looking for, and then your size to the number of coin flips and the probability for a fair coin is 0.5. So for instance, what is going to be the probability? Let me write it up here. So probability of getting exactly 10 heads. When you flip 10 coins, what is the probability of getting exactly 10 heads? So we just give it x equals 10, and then we set the size equals 10 coin flips, and then the prop for a fair coin is 0 0.5. And so when you run that, the probability of getting exactly 10 heads is close to zero. It's close to zero in a fair coin. That is why whenever you are simulating a fair coin and it is appearing each time uh, in favor of a particular um, outcome, then we might have a problem that we are dealing with a bias coin. So what if we're calculating for a bias coin, the probability of getting exactly 10 heads when we flip 10 coins with a probability of 0 0.8 coming up heads with 80% chance it will come up heads. So let's find out uh, the probability of getting exactly 10 heads. So when you do that, the probability of getting exactly 10 heads is 11%. And this is, like I said, it's called the density of the binomial distribution. Now, when we used the D binom function and simulated a fair coin, so this is also a fair coin, but here is a bias coin. So probability of getting exactly five heads, we noticed that was 25%. If we were using the simulation, so let me come up here and use the simulation, but this time around, let us use maybe, let's start from 10, 10 draws, 100 draws, um, 10,000 uh, draws, 10,000 draws, and then up to the 100,000 draws. So if I want to calculate that straight away, then I would take the R by norm and simulate N equals 10, the number of coins is 10, and the probability, the fair coin is 0.5, and then I am going to set this one equal to five heads. So what is the probability of getting exactly five heads when you make 10 draws from tossing 10, 10 coins? And then wrap this whole expression. So remember that when we simulated this kind of code, we saved that into an object called A. So we are grabbing that same code, instead of saving it into another object, we are just using the whole code and setting it equal to five, and then finding the mean at that point, the density at that point. So when you run this, you notice that it is 0 0.2. Now, using the D by norm, we notice that for a fair coin, the probability of getting five heads when you toss 10 coins at the same time is 25%. But when we use only 10 draws for the simulation, we had 0.2, which is some kind of discrepancy between 
um, the correct probability of getting exactly five heads using the D binom because the D binom calculates it correctly. When using 10 draws, we are getting less than that, right? So if you don't take care, you might kind of conflict yourself with, um, with, with the probability in the sense that when you have a large number of observations, the more closer you are to the exact probability of getting the exact number of heads you are looking for. So I am going to copy this same code, and then we are going to simulate for up to that 100,000 and see which one yields a probability close to the correct or the true probability of getting exactly five heads. So if I simulate 100 draws, and then 1,000 draws, and then 10,000 draws, and we've already looked at the 100,000, but let's simulate that one as well. So let us look at the probability. So the probability of getting exactly five heads with 10 coin flips and a fair coin is 0 0.25. For if we simulate 10 observations only, then we get 0 0.2. Hmm. 100 draws, we get 0 0.31, okay? That is way above the probability we are looking for. 1,000 draws, we get 0 0.264. Okay, so 1,000 is getting closer to our correct probability. 10,000, 0 0.2392, so that is 0 0.24. Okay, that's also close. For 100,000, 0 0.245, which is 0 0.25. So this is why we are simulating 100,000 draws, because the larger the number of draws, then the greater chance we are getting a probability close to the true probability. So there are instances where we might be simulating for 10,000 draws or 100,000 draws, but most of the time we'll be using 100,000 draws to make it very uh, huge. And then know that possibly the number of outcomes of getting exactly five heads. So let's go back to the slides. And now we are going to simulate 100,000 draws from a binomial distribution of 10 coin flips and a probability 50% of coming up heads. So what is the probability of getting four heads or less? All right. So we go right into R and practice that also. So probability of getting four heads or less, let's call it flips. That is for the number of coin flips. So flips, and then we use the R binome to simulate. 100,000 draws for 10 coin flips and the probability a fair coin 0 0.5 coming up heads. And so if we should run that now, and then we check the flips is less than or equal to four and find the mean, we will be able to determine the probability of getting four heads or less. So by running that, we notice that the probability of getting four heads or less is approximately 38%. So you can see that if it were in a gamble situation and then we are throwing 10 coins, we are flipping 10 coins at a time and there is, there, there is a, a, a bet, there is money on the floor that if by throwing the 10, fair coins, if you get five heads, then we are going to pay you. So that means let us gamble. You can see that the probability of getting exactly five heads out of the 10 coin toss was just 0 0.25, 25% of getting exactly five heads. But the probability of getting four heads or less is 38%. So between these two, which of these gambling um, um, situations would you like to bet for? Probably you would go in for four heads or less, because that has a greater probability of occurrence than that of getting exactly five heads. So if we were to find the probability of getting four heads or less, then you can see that we are looking at zero heads, one head, two heads, three heads, four heads. So this is called the cumulative density of the binomial distribution at that particular point. Let's go back to the slides and see what's going to happen. So the mean of that binomial distribution of 
tossing 10 coins with the, a, a fair 10 coins, and the probability of you getting four heads or less was approximately 38%, right? And so in the histogram on the right-hand side, you can see that we've colored that one as red, meaning we are looking at the cumulative density, all right? So as it has been explained there, it is known as the cumulative density of the binomial distribution at four heads or less. So in order to calculate cumulative densities of a binomial distribution, R provides the P binom function, which takes in four basic four sets of arguments. The first one is a kill, which actually represents the number of heads that you're going to give it. So if you set your kill equals four, then you mean four heads or less. If you set your kill equals six, it means six heads or less. If you set your kill equals two, it means two heads or less using the P binom. In the D binom, when you set your X equals five, it means exactly five heads. If you set your X equals four, exactly four heads. So take notice of the difference between the D binom and the P binom. So the P binom is a cumulative density. Now the size will be the number of coin flips. So in this case, 10 coin flips. The probability we are going to simulate for a fair coin, so 0 0.5. Now, the lower tail by default is true, which means we are looking at the lower tail of the distribution, all right? So we are looking at a, a, a cumulative density starting from the left, so up to the Q that we give it for the first argument. So if it is four, we know that from the left up to four. So which means that if we're looking at getting uh, more than four heads, then you would have to set the lower dot tail argument to false so that it will consider the right-hand side of the cumulative density. So in which case, if you were looking at getting exactly four heads or less, we just say P by norm, and then we set our Q equals four, the size equals 10, probability equals 0 0.5. Now the lower tail, the lower dot tail argument is already true by default. And so um, you may not need to even specify it if you wish. So let's go ahead and practice the probability of getting four heads or less and see whether it matches with the simulation that we made right here. So in which case, we use the P by norm function and then set our Q argument equals four. And then we set our size equals 10 coin flips. And then we set our probability for a fair coin, which is 0 0.5, and then the lower dot tail argument to true, right? So like I said, the lower dot tail argument is already true by default. So you may or may not need to specify it, but let's specify it explicitly so we know exactly what we are getting. So we notice that by getting the flips um, equal to four heads or less and calculating the mean, we knew that the probability of getting four heads or less was simply 38%. So if we should run this line of code, then we get approximately the same result, a similar result, right? So we see that the probability is also 38% using the P by norm. So if it were, what is the probability of getting more than four heads, then you would go ahead and use the P by norm and then set your Q equals the four, your size equals the 10 coin flips, and the probability for a fair coin is 0 0.5, and then set the lower dot tail argument to false, so that you consider the right side of the um, of the number of heads that you are giving it right there. So when you run that, you will notice that that is also approximately 62%. And so when you add the two, that gives you one. That is the area under the entire distribution. So probability of getting more than four heads will be written as such. Now, if you were also looking at, for instance, when you flip 10 coins, what is the probability? So let's make it when you flip 10 fair coins, what is the probability of, of getting of getting more than six heads? All right, of getting more than six heads, or sometimes we put it of getting six heads or more. That is a question. So in that case, we use the P by norm function, and then we pass five. 
so that the size is 10 coin flips that we get it the probability is 0.5 for a fair coin but then the lower dot tail we set it equal to false and the reason why we are using five is because we are looking at six heads or more so when you set the lower dot tail equals false it is looking at above five which is simply the six or more and then if the lower dot tail was true it would have considered from zero up to five that you have given it right here. So the probability of getting six heads or more is also approximately 38%. So let's go back to the slides and continue. Now, when it comes to the properties of a binomial distribution, every distribution has a center and spread. And so the measure of center for a binomial distribution is simply the mean or what sometimes we usually refer to as the expected value. And then the measure of spread is also the variance. You can also take the square root of the variance to get standard deviation, but we'll look at that later on. So we are going to simulate 100,000 draws from, because we have noticed that by simulating 100,000 draws of a binomial distribution, it always approximates the true probability of getting whatever number of heads that we are looking for. So we are going to simulate 100,000 draws from a binomial distribution with 10 coin flips and a 50% chance of getting heads. What is the mean and what is the variance? So let's go back to R and find out. So now we are going to calculate the mean and variance, the mean and variance of a binomial distribution. So let us call it flips again. And then we are going to simulate using the R binom function. And then we set the N argument to 100,000, the size to 10 coin flips, the probability fair coin, so 0 0.5. And so we go ahead and find the mean of the flips. And that gives us five. Now, this is the center of your distribution. And recall earlier on from the slides that we had a histogram showing from 100,000 draws of 10 coin flips, of, a, of 10 fair coin flips, the most number of occurrence was five because we are simulating a fair, uh, 10 fair coins. So we are expecting that our number of heads should be five and the number of days is five. So at the end of the day, you notice that the mean of the simulation, we had it to be approximately five heads, right? But if we should go ahead and also calculate the variance, we just pass in the, the, the simulation, the flips. So when that happens, we know that the spread is approximately 2.5, right? So how wide um, each occurrence is from each other, is also 2.5. Now let's go back to the slides and see whether we can make some intuition out of this. So with a binomial distribution, it takes in two parameters, the size and the P. The size is the number of coins and the P is the probability of getting heads. So if we are simulating a fair coin, then we are looking at probability of 0.5. Any probability not equal to 0.5 is a bias coin. So how do we calculate the mean of a binomial distribution? It is just simply the expected value of X is the size times the P. And then the variance is the size times P times one minus P. So we notice that from the demonstration in R, when we simulated 100,000 draws of 10 coin flips, 10 fair coin flips, we had the expected value or the mean to be five, and then we had a variance to be around 2.5. So when we draw a binomial distribution of 10 coin flips and a 50% chance of getting heads, then the mean is simply the size times the probability, which is 10 times 0 0.5, and that is equal to 5. And then the variance would be 10 times 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5, and that gives us 2.5 exactly the same results that we had when we did the simulation in R. So for instance, let us look at this particular question. What is the expected value and variance of a binomial distribution with 100 coin flips 
with 30% probability of getting hurt, which means we are simulating a bias coin and there's a 30% probability of getting hurt. And so this means that in order to calculate the expected value, we just simply multiply the size 100 times the probability of getting hurt, 0.3, and then we had the mean to be 30. The variance would be 100 times 0.3 times one minus 0 0.3, and that gives you 21. So the expected value of tossing 100 bias coins the, with 30% probability of you getting heads, you, you are just going to get 30 heads out of the 100 coin flips. And the variance, how spread it is from each other is approximately 21. So if we should go ahead into R and kind of demonstrate this, whether we are getting the, the exact results, then we are going to have so expected value and variance of binomial distribution binomial distribution of 100 coin flips and 30% chance of getting hit. It's just going to be, so let us do the simulation. And so I'm just going to call it flips and we use the R binom function. And then we simulate a hundred thousand draws with a size of 100 coin flips or 100 coins, yes. And then the probability as 0.3, 30% of getting heads. And when that happens, we go ahead and find the mean of the flips and then the variance of the object. And so the mean is simply 29.99881, which is approximately 30 heads. And then the variance is also approximately 21, um, exactly as we had from the slides. So it means that in order to calculate the mean and the expected the expected value and the variance of a binomial distribution, it is just simply the size times the probability. For the mean and for the variance, it is the size times the probability times one minus the probability. So let us look at probability of random events A and B. So let's consider two events A and B. So probability of event A is simply the notation that we're giving there. And we also have the probability of event B. So we toss these two coins, and then what is the probability of obtaining two heads? Now, whenever we have the coins, that we have two coins, and then we flip them at once, what is the probability that both will appear as heads? And what is the probability that we'll get a head and a tail? The tail and a head, the tail and the tail. These are called the sample space, all right? Um, or let's simply call them the likely outcomes after flipping those two coins, all right, so that we, we stay within our probability. So that when we move into statistical inference, we can use sample spacing and all those sort of concepts. So when you toss the two coins, two fair coins, then what is what are the chances that you're going to get both as heads? It is just simply 25%, because there are four possible outcomes after you toss the two coins. It may appear as head head or head tail, tail head, or tail tail. And so there are four possible outcomes. And so the probability of you getting exactly two heads is just simply one out of the four outcomes, which is 0 0.25. And so when you sum up all these probabilities of getting head head, head tail, tail head, or tail tail, we simply get the total probability of one, which we initially agreed on as a fundamental rule of probability, must lie between zero and one. So at the end of the day, let us go and simulate this kind of situation of finding the probability of two random events, A and B. So we are going to simulate for an event A and we'll simulate for an event B with two coin flips, but it should be fair coins. And let's see what is going to happen, whether we are going to get 0 0.25. So when we're using the probability of two heads, the probability of getting heads the first time is 0 0.5 times the probability of getting the other head is also 0 0.5. And so when we multiply the two, we are getting 0 0.25. So let's go ahead and practice it and see. So we're going to simulate 100,000 draws of a fair coin for an event A, 100,000 draws of a fair coin for an event B, and is the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. This happens to be one of the 
rules of probability. And let's go and find out how that is going to be. Okay. All right. So let's go right into R. And then let's give it a very nice heading. So probability of, let's call it two random events. A, yeah, A and B. So we simulate for A, a binomial distribution, we draw 100,000 draws, and I believe we understand why, because it's very close to the true probability we are going to get. And then the size, we set it equal to one, because we are looking at only two outcomes, zero and one, all right? Zero and one, so size equals one, so tails and heads. And the probability, it's a fair coin, so 0 0.5. Now I'm going to grab the same line of code, but this time around simulate for an event B. And so I run the two lines of code. When I run the two lines of code, what are the chances that in both events, we have head here and head there. So we have head in A and heads in B. So we can do that using the ampersand operator, which simply means and in R, so A and B. By calling out only the A, you'll notice that we have zeros and ones, tails and heads for 100,000 draws. And then by calling out the B also, we also have the zeros and ones, all right? Because we set the size equal to one, so it's zero and one. So we are going to use the A and B to find cases where at the same trial or at the same point, we had head in A and then head in B. So we are looking at where both came up as heads. So if I want to interpret this a little bit more for you to understand what we are doing, we have too many observations. So let me just pull out the first five because that is a vector. So the first five for A and then the first five for B, so that at least we can compare um, what I really want to explain for that. So in the first five draws, you will notice that each time for the first two draws of A, we had one one, right? But it appeared as tails in B. So there is not an occurrence of both heads appearing. Here is a head, and then tail, head, tail, tail, tail. So here, why don't we extend the number of draws to let's call out 10 draws and then run them both and see. Great, so we can see that for the seventh draw, the seventh draw for event A and B both appeared as heads. This is what we are looking for. And so if we use the A and B and then run that, we are going to get cases where they were both heads, and that is just going to be true. And where they are false, it means that they were alternating outcomes, right? So when we use the A and B, we go ahead and find the mean of where both are heads. So if you run this, we are getting 25%. Is that exactly what we had from the slides? Yes, of course, 25% that it will both come up as heads. So, if you do that for A and B, another way is by just trying to say maybe A equals one and B also equals one. It's the same thing. If you make it A and B, it's just going to take where they were both ones and find the mean that gives the probability that they both are heads. If you also make it A equals one, B equals one, fine. That also gives you the same kind of result. So you also have a 25% probability that they both appeared as heads in the two um, events. So at the end of the day, after simulating for that, we can also simulate for a bias coin. What we just simulated was for a fair coin because the probability we specified as 0 0.5. But we can also simulate 100,000 draws of a bias coin for an event A with a probability of 20% coming up heads. And then we also have an event B with a probability of 70% coming up heads. Now, remember that 
we got to realize that the probability that it appeared as head in the event A and the probability that it will appear as head in the event B is each 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So we multiply the two and then we had 0 0.25. So this confirms the general rule that the probability of an event A and B is simply probability of A times the probability of B. So if we are going to simulate for an event A with a probability of 20% coming up heads and B with a probability of 70% coming up heads, then it means that the probability of getting exactly, um, um, of getting both appearing as heads would be 0 0.2 times 0 0.7. Let's go and simulate that in R2 and see what result we get and move on. Let me write some comments so that when you have the script, you can actually follow. So in two random events, A and B, where A <clears throat> has a probability has a probability of getting heads as 20%. And B, event B has 70% probability of getting heads. Then what is the probability of obtaining both heads? So in which case we are going to simulate again but this time around, we are going to set the probability at 0 0.2 for event A. And then for event B, we set the probability at 0 0.7 coming up heads. Then when we finish, we go ahead and find the mean of A and B. So by running these two simulations and finding the mean, we get a 14% probability of obtaining both heads in the two random events. Let's go back to the slides. So has it been confirmed 0 0.2 times 0 0.7? And that is exactly one of the things that we did. So if, if events A and B are independent, so um, you will try this on your own, okay, later on. If events A and B are independent, and A has a 40% chance of happening, and event B has a 20% chance of happening, what will be the probability that they will both happen? It is just simply the probability of A times the probability of B. So in which case, we've even practiced that already. Okay. So here, it means that we are just going to have the probability as 0 0.4 times 0 0.2. And that is going to be the probability that the two events will both happen. Then we also have probability of random event A or B. So we are going to use this Venn diagram as an illustration. So we have event A colored as pink and event B colored as blue, light blue. And there are two overlapping um, circles, all right? So the probability of A or B happening is simply the probability of A plus the probability of B. So you just find the union of these two um, circles, of these two um, events. So probability of A plus the probability of B. But when you do that, you've added the entire region of A and the entire region of B. But with this random event at the point where they are overlapping, if you allow it to be so, then you have for instance, getting A without overlapping and getting B without overlapping, all right? So if you actually say probability of A plus probability of B, then you, you are causing what we call double counting, okay? If you are looking at probability of event A or B. And so we go ahead and subtract the probability of A and B at the point where they overlap. For instance, if you have a probability of A or B happening, if we are simulating a coin toss, the probability of getting A is 0 0.5 and the probability of getting B is 0 0.5, then the probability of A or B is simply 0 
plus 0 0.5 minus the probability that they both will happen, which is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. And that simply would be equal to 0 0.75. So we are going to demonstrate this one very soon and then we'll see. So we are considering the fact that if we are looking at probability of A and B, then the probability of A and B, as we have looked at previously, is just simply the probability of A times the probability of B. So let's go and then simulate this kind of result and see what we're going to get. Each has a probability of 0 0.5, so A or B. Let us simulate two events and find the probability that either event happen. So we put the question this way. We will do that for the fair queen, which means we have a probability of 0 0.5, then we'll do that for a bias queen, and where the question is going to be of this form. If queens A and B are independent, and A has a 60% chance of coming up heads, and even B has a 10% chance of coming up heads, what is the probability either A or B will come up heads? So let's do that for the fair queen. Then after that, we consider this bias queen question that we have right here. So it means that we are going to simulate the two events and we are going to do that for two uh, fair coins. So let me copy this code and bring it down here and then give it the nice heading. So probability of events A or B, great. So we simulate for the two, two fair coins and then A, or B, in order to use A or B or in as code in, in R, um, we use the pipe operator, the straight pipe operator, all right? And that is what I've just written right here. So on your keyboard, you will notice this key. So the or operator. And then you go ahead and simply find the mean that A or B will happen. And then that is 75%, right? just as we had in the slides, when it was 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. So it is, it was 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. And then we had 0 0.75. And exactly as we had it over here. So which means that the probability that either event happen is just simply probability of A plus probability of B minus probability that both will happen. And you can use that in R, finding the mean of A or B in this sort of simulation. So let me go back to the slides and then try to see if I can copy this and then paste it in R so you can have the question. All right, and so let's break this one and break it to fit within our window and comment all of this. So control shift and C. So the question is if coins A and B are independent and A has a 60% chance of coming up here. So let's do that simulation. So A is going to be an R binom of 100 thousand draws 100,000 draws with size of one for zero and one outcomes and then the probability of 0 0.5 for a fair coin and then event B sorry it is 60 percent chance of coming up head so 0 0.6 then event B has a 10 percent chance of coming up heads so R by norm n equals hundred thousand. The size is one and the probability is 0 0.1. Then what is the probability that either A or B will come up heads? So we just simply find the mean of A or B. So let's run these and see what results we get. And that is simply 64%. So let's find out, it would have been 0 0.6 plus 0 0.1 minus the probability that both will be heads. So that is 0 0.6 times 0 0.1. And if you should run that, okay, we get 64% probability that um, either A or B 
will come up as heads. So if you were doing that for more than two events, then the probability of A or B or C in terms of probability would be the probability of A plus probability of B plus probability of C minus the point where they overlap, probability of A and B minus probability of A and C minus probability of B and C plus the probability that all three will happen. So at the end of the day, if you also wanted to simulate that in R, then you could have made it, um, you, you simulate for event A, B, and C, and then you would use the mean of A or B or C, and you get the probability that either of these three events will happen. Now, in binomial distribution, there is this concept known as multiplying random variables. So when you flip a fair coin 10 times and count the number of heads, we take that number and then we triple it. What do you think happens to the mean, to the variance? So we are going to simulate 100,000 draws from a binomial distribution with 10 coin flips and then a 0.5% probability, a 0.5 probability that it will come up heads. So we are simulating a fair coin. And then let's see what happens to the mean and that of the variance, all right? Okay. And so let's go into R and practice that. So the heading would be multiplying, multiplying random event. We are just going to simulate for A, event A, R by norm function, where N equals 100,000. And our size is 10 coins, so 10 coin flips. And our probability is 0 0.5 for a fair coin. Or let me use X instead of A, all right? So let's call it probability of event X. Because um, we have some um, formula representation in the slides and I want it to match with the X so we get exactly what, what, what happens. So we end up finding the mean of X. So let us simulate that. And if we should find the mean of X, we get approximately five. That is the center of the distribution, okay. But if we multiply a number three by the X, that is three times X, and then we save it into Y. So we multiply some number by the random event. Then what do you think is going to happen to the mean and perhaps the variance? So what I'm going to do is after finding the mean, I'm also going to go ahead and find the variance of X so that when we finish, we compare the two and see what really happens. So after the simulation, we find the mean of X and it's 4.99, which is five. The variance is 2.49, which is also 2.5. Then we multiply three by X. So the each draw in the 10 coin flips has become three times larger. So what happens? To the mean and then what happens to the variance so if you find the mean of y it is 14.97 which is 15 right and then the variance is 22.49 which is 22.5 hmm. so what really happens is the mean approximately is five when it was just x but when we multiply by three to make it three times larger the mean was 15 so which means that whenever you multiply a number by a random event, then that number also gets multiplied or yeah, it is multiplied by the expected value. So the expected value also increases by a multiplicative factor of that number. But when it comes to the variance, the variance was 2.5, but we ended up getting 22.5. That is very huge. So we multiply three by X, if it had been three squared times the variance of X. Now the variance of X is 2.5, right? But then when I multiply the random event by three, the variance is three squared, the three squared, because the, the spread is going to be also three times wider. So let's see what's gonna happen, three squared. And if I should multiply, we get a 22.5. Okay, let's go back to the slides and understand this kind of um, intuition. So when you multiply a random 
variable by a number, you end up multiplying the expected value by that number. So we have this mathematical representation where the expected value of a number multiplying the random event X equals the number times the expected value of X. So it's just the number times the mean also. And the variance also gets bigger by a factor of the number squared. So the variance of K times the random event equals the number squared times the variance of the random event. So this is the kind of property that we can deduce when it comes to multiplying random variables. Also, we are adding two random variables and let's see what is gonna happen. So suppose that we also run a simulation of 100,000 draws with 10 coin flips and 50% chance of getting heads. I'll be wrapping up very soon. And we also simulate for a Y and then we add the two random events and then store into X, then what really happens? Let's go back to R. So we are going to practice that. That is the next slide. And let's see. So let's call this adding to random event. So we are going to simulate for an event X, which is simply the R binom. Okay, let me just go up there and grab because that is the same kind of simulation that we are doing right here. So we'll simulate for an event X and we'll simulate for an event Y. And then we will go ahead and create an object called Z and add the two random events so that we can end up finding the mean of Z and finding the variance of Z and then compare with the mean of X plus y because we are right we are, we are adding them up and then the variance of x plus y so when we do that what really happens so when we add the two random events and find the mean it's the same thing that we are doing right here right so x plus y the variance of x plus y would be the variance of x okay so let's find the mean of x the variance of x the mean of y and then the variance of y, right? So, and let's see what's gonna happen. So let's run them. So the simulation, now let us also add them, right? But then we find the mean of x, which is five, the variance of x, which is 2.5, the mean of y is five, the variance of y is 2.5, but we find the mean of z, we have 10, okay? And the variance of z is also five. Do we have any sort of pattern? The mean of X was five and the mean of Y was five, but the mean of the X plus Y was 10. So it means that when you add two random events, the mean of the added random event equals the, uh, the addition of the mean of each random event. And the variance also happens to be the same. The variance of X is 2.5 and the variance of Y is 2.5. And so when you add these two, it's also equal to the variance of the added event. Okay, so I think the intuition will be very clear from the slides right here. And so you really observe what happened when the variables were added. We notice that the expected value of the addition of the two random events was simply equal to the expected value of the addition of the expected value of each random event. So expected value of X plus the expected value of Y. And then the variance of X plus Y was also equal to the variance of X plus the variance of Y. And that is exactly what we had from the simulation. So we will bring the lesson to an end on the binomial distribution. And then we can have one lecture, which should be around 40 minutes to close up on the normal distribution, the Poisson distribution, and then the geometric distribution that we end the foundations of probability with R. So at this point, I'll be accepting questions and if you have any question, uh, you bring it on board and then we look at it. Thank you very much for attending this meeting. Question time.